Welcome, Secretary Kerry. We are very grateful to have you here with us. Um, we had asked everyone, if you wouldn't mind jumping in right at the beginning, um, to just assess for us the one critical success and one critical failure from COP28 as we then turn our attention to COP29. Um, well, thank you. And my profound apologies to everybody for being late. Um, I had a, um, a meeting with um, Premier um, Li Chang, which was unexpected, but it was important enough that uh, it sort of upset the schedule, and I apologize to everybody. Also, um, uh, we were upstairs in a meeting with major corporate leadership, which is critical to the decision-making that will decide whether COP28 uh, is as meaningful as some of us think it truly is. So let me answer <clears throat> the question, um, and I'm not, I'm not uh, reaching for a conclusion that I don't think is there when I say that it's not just one thing that was really quite significant here. Um, this COP, I've been to COPs since we set it up in 1992 in Rio, and so for years with Kyoto to Copenhagen, Poland, various places, I've seen uh, how this can work and how it cannot work. And Paris was a direct result of it not working in Copenhagen. And the conclusion we all came to is that every nation had to make up its own plan. Not exactly the most effective thing, but it's the best that could be done. What happened with both Glasgow and Sharm el Sheikh building towards it was that in, in Dubai, uh, we were able uh, to change that paradigm to some degree with one critical paragraph. And that paragraph is that we must transition away from fossil fuels. Remember, we could not get a resolution between phase out, phase down in Glasgow. And there was no mention of this in Paris. But in Dubai, 195 countries, including oil producing, oil gas producing countries, came to consensus that we must say to the world that we must transition away from fossil fuels. But they didn't leave it there. That's not where it stopped. This is the largest success is that it said, in keeping with the science, which means once again reinforcing the 1.5 degrees, which the science has now settled on as critical, and it also said, in furtherance of the objective, which we all accepted, of having a net zero by 2050, which is a hard stop uh, plan, and finally, the critical words accelerating in this decade. Now, when you add all of that together, folks, and 195 countries have signed off on it, that is a profound, important paradigm shift because everybody is now working by a stronger guidepost, a guideline, a guardrail, if you will, which is that we must achieve by 2030 the 43% minimal reduction globally, and that we need to do other things. Now, you add to that that in Dubai, we had one day committed to uh, methane. China and the United States stood up on the same podium and came together saying, here's the China plan, here's our plan, we're going to work together. We actually created a working group, which we just met on the other day with Xi Jinping, my counterpart, who's retiring, but we decided that... Uh, uh, this working group is going to work together to help implement on the methane. That's a big deal. In addition to which, on day one, because we worked all summer in the diplomacy leading up to it, we were able to agree that we took one of the most contentious issues of all off the table, which was effectively a cop killer called loss and damage, but which we found common ground to be able to set up a real fund with people understanding it's real, with initial funding in it, not sufficient to be able to be the payout, but money that is there in order to set up the fund, fundamentally, to make it real, to get the workings going, to put the 
uh, rules in place and to work with the World Bank where it will be housed to make it happen. To have that passed on the first day without contention helped establish what we were able to do with the rest of it. And then you look at the combination of health, first day ever, health is linked to, uh, to uh, uh, climate, which it is, and the first time we've really had food and food production and food consumption on the table as a separate issue. This was a game-changing cop and outcome. And, but I will add the caveat. What's the downside? The downside is that it's words on paper. And we've been through Paris, and we've been through <laughs> subsequent uh, Sharm el-Sheikh and so forth, Glasgow, and we know that if people aren't going to act on those words, we're in serious trouble. And we are right now knowing that the latest scientific assessment is we're at 1.545, we're at 1.48 degrees now. Now, that doesn't mean that's a permanent status, but there's very little to show that there's enough transition already taking place that it won't blow us past 1.5 degrees and we're going to have to claw back. That's the downside. And we've got to recognize that reality, and we've got to start to address that reality here at this uh, meeting in, in, in the WEF, but in everything that happens now this year. It means no business as usual. It can't just be sitting there saying, okay, we're going to open up the following oil field, and we're going to pump away like that. We have to affect the transition. And the final comment I'll make quickly is, we today have the available technology to actually live up to our requirement by 2030. We're just not deploying it fast enough. I'll tell you who is deploying it fast enough is a place called China, which is deploying more renewables and manufacturing more renewables than all the rest of the world put together. And I guarantee you that the amount of renewable they are now already deploying, even though they may not have changed it publicly, is going to have an impact on the date that they peak and I think Fatih will agree with me, and it will have an impact on their reduction of emissions, which is critical to all of us to winning this battle. So we are in a different world, folks, post-COP28. And the issue is going to be, do we live up to our responsibilities to do what's necessary to make that different world real for the long term? That's the challenge. Secretary Kerry, I want to take uh, questions from the audience, but before we do that, could you briefly talk on this issue? How do you think that the world, um, as we head into COP29 in this year of so many elections around the globe, how do you think that the world should think about American leadership on the climate issue going forward, given the fact that the U.S. election is quite uncertain? Well, uh, first of all, it's January, and the election is bound to look uncertain no matter what the numbers were. Uh, and there's a lot of history to be made in one way or the other over the course of these next months, um, which, you know, I'm quite confident is, is going to uh, have an impact on, on, on the outcome, and I'll speak to that in a minute. Can I, I just want to clarify a thing. First, uh, Fatih, thank you for your incredibly generous words. And I have obviously enjoyed enormously our relationship, and uh, I have news for you. I'm not retiring. <laughs> uh, I'm not retiring, folks. I'm simply facing the reality. Because it's an election year, there's not much that's going to happen in the Congress mm -hmm. this year. I am hatched. In other words, by under law, the hatch law in our country, because I'm a federal employee, I'm not allowed to engage in the, in the, in the campaign. That's not going to happen. So I, I want to be able to speak out on that and other issues globally, but I'm going to stay at this. Uh, and, and there are so many different ways to continue to be able to be engaged in this. So unfortunately, you're stuck. You'll see me at the cop. You'll see me. Uh, can't get rid of me yet. Uh, and I'd be around, and it's my honor and privilege to, to work with you and others. Uh, uh, on this going forward. Uh, we'd, we'd really have a moment to, to make a change. And I'm very excited about the prospect. I think the private sector is going to be critical to our ability to meet this challenge, and I intend to be uh, engaged in that. So enough on that. 
on the elections and and uh, where we're going with climate. Let me look, folks. Um, People will want to scare people and say, oh, my God, you know, and, and to some degree, there's a proposition that suggests that one candidate or another may scare some people. But let me be clear. Uh, CEOs of the largest corporations in the world are really smart people. And they may make a bad judgment here or there, but it's not, you know, they're, they're, they know what they're doing. Uh, there was no way that the companies I talked about earlier, uh, you know, and particularly Ford. Do you think Ford and General Motors and Mercedes and Volkswagen and Hyundai and Toyota and all these, and Mercedes and whatever, do you think those CEOs are going to say, oh, my God, they just elected a new president. Let's go back and build internal combustion engine cars. Not on your life. Not happening. This economic revolution is underway. And it's much bigger than any politician, any one person. Even when Donald Trump was president of the United States, guess what? 75, he pulled out of Paris, but the American people and the governors stayed in Paris. We have 37 governors, Republican and Democrat alike, who, who implemented their renewable portfolio laws, and, and they continued to deploy clean electricity and clean energy and so forth. That's not going to change. Even when Trump was president, 75% of the new electricity in the United States of America was from renewables. And now it's about 90 and 95% or something. So we're on this road. 85% of the IRA money, the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act money, guess what? It's going to red states, as, we, as they're called. You think those congressmen are going to turn around and say, hey, take those jobs away from here now? I don't think so. So I just don't see that happening. And I think the American public, this is going to be one of the reasons I want my voice back to be able to go out and get involved is this issue is a voting issue. And, and people ought to go to the polls because they want to continue down this road and see this new economy emerge and not have air that kills them and gives them diseases and sends their kids to the hospital in the summer from environmentally induced asthma and so forth. The arguments for why we need to continue this are profound and critical and, and really will make a difference, I believe, as it gets out there. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about uh, where we're going to wind up. And, um, you know, there are some very serious criminal charges still pending with respect to what amounts to, uh, you know, uh, 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 insurrectionist activity in your country, in our country, lack of, uh, of, of upholding the Constitution and so forth. I'm not going to talk about the politics of it, but everybody knows this is a very volatile and profoundly uh, long period of time that's going to play out. And, and just don't, don't get caught up making judgments today. Keep your eyes focused on the prize. Do what we need to do to implement what we did in Dubai. Do what we need to do to get those renewables out there that are able today to help us meet the standard by 2030. Let's not lose the options we have still available to us. That's the key here. And forget about the politics for the time being. Uh, and, and you'll see a playing field to start to take shape by summertime and so forth. But um, I have confidence in the American people who made the right choice in 2020, and we'll see where we come out here.